Welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming. Uh, most of you I know, but those of you I don't, I'm Mark Linder, and I'm the organizer of this series that's called Image Precisely, and its aim is to invigorate and expand our understanding of the humanities and their public significance. It's a transdisciplinary project uh, that invites participants from various fields of knowledge to consider images as a subject of research that invites them to operate precisely at the limits of their expertise, where disciplinary rigor is still possible, um, but claims of authority and mastery have to be abandoned. So at this time when disciplinary identities and boundaries are shifting, when the value and motives of scholarship are transforming, and when media and its audiences are rapidly transforming, evolving, defining the humanities is both confounding and divisive, as is understanding how the humanities, what we call the humanities, intersect with the sciences, with politics, or with emerging technologies. But as we all recognize, this changing landscape is latent with potential for significant alterations and reconfigurations of the university and the work that it does. Uh, so this project proposes images as a general topic that can channel that potential. Images are both a complex subject of inquiry and a quickly evolving mode of cultural currency, which requires or allows all of us to consider innovative methods and resources and to shuffle the presumed territories, limits, and purposes of our academic fields. While that may be an old desire, I hope it's not a tired ambition. And certainly our speaker tonight, Barbara Murray Stafford, has been tireless in her efforts to assert images and imaging process in art and science and in media uh, as a compellingly pervasive and perplexing field of knowledge with specific cognitive and formal properties that need to be learned, those are her words, or that require new kinds of collaborations among disciplines in order to be understood. These things always begin with some sort of a personal anecdote, and I, I, I won't avoid that myself. <laughs> uh, I, I first learned of Barbara's work in the first week of my doctoral studies. Uh, when our pro seminar read one of her early papers on Winkelmann, titled The Beauty of the Invisible. And for me, reading that paper removed any doubts, and I had many, <laughs> that I had at that point about the creative and speculative possibilities of deep scholarship. But more important, rereading it just recently, it's clear that, there's insight, that there are insights and interests in that 1980 paper that prefigure what she will discuss tonight. First is the attempt to make sense of the elusive visibility of quote images, which as something more which are something more than products of simple perception. Stafford in that article explains that Winkelmann believed, quote, not only do we have perceptions of immaterial essence as essences as real and sure as our perceptions of material essences, but the invisible acts upon the visible. I can't help but to imagine that our more recent interest in the findings of neuroscience regarding the complex, autopoetic, self-organizing, and pre-perceptual aspects of brain processes, and our ongoing projects to understand what she calls the cognitive history of images, is almost uh, an inevitable extension of her interest in 1980 and what she called the aesthetics of imperceptibility. More productively and provocatively than anyone I know, Barbara Stafford has embraced the challenges that cognitive science and neuroscience pose to art practices, art history, and the humanities in general. As she puts in her essay, Crystal and Smoke, the introduction to her recent book, A Field Guide to a New Metafield, Bridging the Humanities and Neuroscience Divide, the humanities today are confronted with the revolutionary and somewhat unsettling notion that our understanding of the world is more a construction of neural networks than a deliberate reflection or projection of that world. Her intellectual project, the first inklings of which emerged in her 1997 book, Good Looking, Essays on the Virtues of Images, has been to explore the possibility of collaborative projects in which neuroscience and the humanities have an equal investment 
and can expect equal outcomes, she writes. Sorry. Sorry about that. And she asks, how do we widen the visual side of humanities and social sciences with new knowledge coming from neuroscience? And at the same time, how do we broaden the revolutionary innovations coming from cognitive science and neuroscience by injecting the long tradition of the humanities into the formulation of science, engineering, and technology research projects that have the capacity to tackle problems that would otherwise remain unsolvable or even inconceivable. Barbara comes to us today from Atlanta, where since 2010 she's been a distinguished university visiting professor at Georgia Tech, with the daunting but fascinating charge to build transdisciplinary relationships among bioengineering, cognitive sciences and neurosciences, the digital media program, and even the School of Architecture. <laughs> Previously, for three decades, she was at the University of Chicago, where in 1995 she became the William B. Ogden Distinguished Service Pro Professor and was also a member of the so their Society of Fellows. I can only mention a, strong, a small fraction of her honors and her achievements, but to give you a glimpse, they include a fellowship at the Institute of Advanced Study in Visual Arts, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Alexander von Humboldt Senior Prize, numerous book prizes, other fellowships, and board memberships, and her other books, in addition to those I've already mentioned, all of which bear in one way or another on uh, the Images Precisely project, uh, include body criticism, imaging the unseen in enlightenment art and medicine, Artful Science, Enlightenment, Entertainment, and the Eclipse of Visual Education, Devices of Wonder, Consciousness and the Art of Connecting, a catalog of an exhibition uh, at the Getty Center, uh, and most more recently than all of those, Echo Objects, the Cognitive Work of Images. So last, but before uh, Barbara comes up here to wow us with her uh, insights and examples, uh, I want to thank Sandra Hewitt, uh, Beverly Peterson Bishop Professor of Neuroscience and Director of Interdis the Interdisciplinary Neuroscience Studies Program, who has offered to, and has indeed, uh, co-sponsored tonight's event. Uh, and more importantly, since she's arrived in SU just a few years ago, uh, has been an incredibly enthusiastic partner in pursuing humanity science interactions. So thank you very much uh, to Sam. Uh, so with that, Welcome, Barbara Stafford. Thank you. Oh, no, I need my light. Oh, sorry. Oh, light. Okay. I, I have no other. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. And my gosh, now you all know how old I am, how aged after that 1980 Winkelmann article, and how wonderful that you saw I have this lifelong relationship with the invisible. Anyway, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. It's been a wonderful afternoon um, in Mark's seminar, and uh, I will do my best. Uh, what I want to do this evening um, is to actually do something that uh, Mark kindly mentioned, and that is to find a moment of parity uh, between the arts, the visual arts, which is my domain, and the sciences. That is a moment of intersection um, where um, an issue is defined and equally important um, for those of us in the humanities, especially the visual side of the humanities, and it is also of equal importance uh, on the science side, the brain science side, the neuroscience side. And what I've been working on has been the diminishing, what shall I say, the diminishing evidence in our world of um, voluntary awareness, that is a kind of attentiveness and attention uh, that is not foisted on us from the outside, that doesn't come from our various autopoetic systems, uh, that is not programmed in and therefore addressing the reward systems of the brain, um, in our PDAs and our uh, various apparatuses and devices, but where choice um, becomes significant. And I want to point out the significant role of images in really illuminating that. 
The second thing that I want to do, and or perhaps say I want to associate it with, is um, something that has gone out uh, with, as Norbert Wiener said, with cybernetics, um, and that is slowness. Um, actually, the High Museum, I'm very proud to say in Atlanta, has now, be, because of the work I've done, um, uh, has instituted a small program for snow, slow looking. And I'm going to speak about the importance of that, which also seems to me goes with this issue of voluntarism. So let me begin, and I may have to turn out more lights. Uh, I want to begin uh, with Auden, W.H. Auden, uh, known to most of you as an absolutely marvelous British poet. But uh, I want to turn to his religious writings uh, that are less well known. And um, as I do it, I'd like you to look at this uh, rather wonderful German romantic painting by Philipp Otto Runge, um, as I quote Auden. To pray is to pay attention or shall we say to listen to someone or something other than oneself. Whenever a man so concentrates his attention, be it on a landscape or a poem or geometrical problem or the true God, that he so completely forgets his own ego and desires in listening to what the other has to say, he is praying. Auden importantly continues to say that what he is talking about is the opposite of Christian petitionary prayer. That is where you ask for something in return. Um, I would suggest to you that what he's talking about is close to, say, Buddhist mindfulness. Uh, having worked quite a while in my Devices of Wonder show on wonder, uh, particularly in the adoring angels in the foreground, we're getting close uh, to this particular concept. I think I want to plunge us in the dark. Which one is that, Jeff? Uh, the, which, which one? I don't want to do. It's too bright. I, you really need to see what I'm talking about. Thank you, thank you. And you can up see quite obviously that this is not the petitionary. Um, I'm going to back into my larger topic. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a few set pieces uh, to introduce some concepts. Uh, I want to turn next with that concept, this concept of non-petitionary and also of awe uh, and mindfulness to a contemporary installation uh, curated uh, by the Czech artist Katarina Seda called It Doesn't Matter. And it shows uh, the central piece of work in this rather complex work, uh, which shows, this is simply a photograph of the beginning of the installation. Uh, the installation is some 600 drawings, uh, parsimonious drawings of the kind, diagrammatic of the kind we're looking at here. And the installation uh, was um, done by her grandmother, Jana, who after the death of her husband, um, fell into a profound melancholia. She no longer washed, she didn't dress, she didn't cook. And um, what happened is her granddaughter, the curator, uh, engaged her in a project. And the project resulted in, as I said, some 600 drawings from memory. I want to come back to this, that were labeled, interestingly, by the grandmother, who had not showed any interest in this, of the rather uh, surprising items like putty knives, saw blades, spanners, mops, and ladders. And it turns out that for 33 years, she was head of uh, the stock room uh, at a home supply shop in uh, uh, in Czechoslovakia, in Brunn, the town of Brunn. And this activity, I, what I'm getting at is creation, creativity, and memory. Um, again, I want to say she remembered amazingly, after this period of melancholia, some 650 items, including their prices. Um, and I want to make several points about this. Uh, first of all, Art, at some level, 
um, is attending to someone else. I'm going to make that argument. It is about attending to something or someone else. And in that sense, it is a deep social practice. Uh, it is also, as I hope to show you, a rather wonderful uh, evidence. It gives rather wonderful evidence uh, for the plasticity of the neural networks um, and of all our neurophysiological mechanisms. It provides also evidence, this case certainly does, for the effect of the environment on brain activity and microanatomy, the attentiveness, the concern of the granddaughter. And it captures uh, what the dancer uh, Yvonne Rayner uh, memorably said, the mind is a muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it. I also want to use um, this particular um, this particular instance to introduce you to the concept of neuroaesthetics. Neuroaesthetics uh, received its formal definition by a wonderful French neuroscientist, um, rather humanistic French neuroscientist. He works with Pierre Boulez in Paris, uh, Jean Pierre. Changeux. Jean-Pierre Changeux, who was also, uh, if I have any literary people or philosophers in the audience, continental philosophers, um, he was also a good friend of uh, Paul Ricoeur, the, phenomena the French phenomenologist, and actually they wrote some and had dialogues on creativity. And um, these dialogues actually go back to the um, uh, 1990s, the mid-1990s, the first book, Raison et Plaisir, Reason and Pleasure, and continued on. Um, what I want to concentrate on as we think about this amazing event um, uh, uh, in uh, this particular installation is Changeux's workspace model of the mind. Uh, where Changeux was interested, um, how memory uh, actually is a, a function that pervades um, and is an important component in the creative process, particularly in higher level synthetic brain functioning. Um, Changeux was interested, even in the mid 90s, uh, in finding what he called the neural bases of art. Uh, he was interested in it, not just because he was a friend of uh, Pierre Boulez, the famous French composer and conductor, uh, but because he believed that art um, is, uh, the art functions are the most highly synthetic and unifying. They unify uh, in every way distraught and distracted a restless human mind. Um, and they also um, unify the work of the prefrontal cortex uh, with the limbic system, that old emotional um, lizard uh, system of the brain. Um, in subsequent books, uh, he was particularly interested in precisely what happens here, namely that one of the side effects of creative activity is that they link short-term and long-term memory. Things that you thought you had forgotten that are of no importance, like my Winkelmann uh, essay. Things that still, my God, live again. Um, that you refocalize, and I'm getting to attention here, uh, you refocalize those. Um, art helps you refocalize um, short-term, I'm sorry, long-term memory in short-term memory uh, because the emotional qualities, affect, um, are still wrapped around it. Significantly, of course, what you bring back is not the rich, full experience that you originally had. It's characterized by what psychologists call parsimony. And I want to uh, draw your attention to the fact that these 600 plus drawings possess precisely that parsimony, that visual uh, diagrammatic uh, look, um, uh, a, a kind of reduction and abstraction to simple aesthetic patterns. But reason and pleasure, sensation, all in a way, um, 
connected. Um, an argument that he makes subsequently um, uh, in the physiology of truth. So artistic, uh, I met, I could say many, many more things, but I, the last thing I want to say about the workspace model and Changeux, and of course there are many people now after Changeux, um, uh, particularly Stanislas de Heyn, um, his student, um, who continue and have continued in many different directions this initial investigation. Um, but I want to go uh, back um, and underscore the fact that Changery points out that the work of art requires not a casual retrieval, not an automatic retrieval of these memories, of course that occasionally happens, but voluntary, and it's the voluntaryism, um, the conscious retrieval uh, that particularly uh, interests me. With that under our belts, let's for a moment go back to the Runge. Um, I've made the argument in what I said in the beginning that there is something about attention that Auden gets at, a kind, and um, I want to um, paraphrase it as a kind of attending fully, uh, a being present to. Now you could say to me, art historians in the audience will say, it is of course a wonderful example of Christian agape uh, that is a kind of shared but unerotic love, um, a non-demanding, non-egalitarian love, where one is invaded, invaded by an irresistible power that one consents to and rejoices in, but does not demand. There's so I'm trying to get at some of the qualities that this attentiveness um, uh, possesses. Now this afternoon we had a wonderful discussion of computers and digital imagery and I want to make a point here, particularly since I'm on the voluntary rather than the autopoetic, rather than the automatic, and say that something has crept into the scientific papers uh, that I've been reading, uh, articles in science, in nature, books that I've mentioned, that's, that's rather troubling. And I think that this is something maybe that um, uh, the visual arts and literature as well might contribute to a collaborative project. And that is to uh, underline the fact that there is a profound difference between the language and the metaphors of automaticity, uh, which come out of cybernetics, and the metaphors and language that come out of spontaneity. Spontaneity, uh, which belongs to biology and the imagination. And I say this quite historically accurately. Uh, Runge uh, was a great friend of the Jena Romantics, um, and Romantic biology still has much to teach uh, the modern world, um, particularly if you look at this, the fact that this is a painting within a painting, the frame is also painted, so it's a kind of meta image, and you notice the organicism of the border um, that um, quoting Buffon, the great 18th century naturalist, um, biology is in fact how life is formed and shaped as opposed to cybernetics. And I will spend a little time on this distinction uh, because I will come back to it in terms of differences in imagery. Um, of course, I'm not being a computer uh, basher. Computers are technologies of liberation. No one will deny that. Um, but, and I'm going to quote Stanley Kubrick, um, as systems become more centralized, as personal data becomes more exposed and data mining becomes more sophisticated, it becomes a machine to monitor and manipulate people. It's not, says Kubrick, that computers start to act like people, but rather that people start to act like computers. And you might well ask, how is that? Uh, and I now come to the issue of speed. If we say that biology uh, is about unfolding, uh, about epigenetics, about evolution, about growth, slow growth, 
sometimes, um, then we're talking in the world of cybernetics and com computation about speed. Uh, Nicholas Carr, who has written several books with MIT, my quote comes from Does IT Matter, um, uh, says the following. We are transferring our intelligence into the machine, and the machine is transferring its way of thinking uh, into us. And again, and this is the important quote, we are beginning to process information as if we were, uh, as if we are nodes. Having said that, I should show you what is not my topic. So as I said, I'm backing into my topic. I have six images to show you. And ask you, what is this? What is this? Well, I'm going to argue this is by Philip Toledano, a uh, contemporary photographer. And um, I'm going to argue, I mean, it's called game faces, probably first person shooters. Um, I'm saying that this is not my topic because this is not aware awareness. What it shows, I believe, are captive or ensnared computer game players. That is captive without being aware, um, in, uh, with the inability to pause or still the image, uh, or to continue the language of film criticism, the inability to fade to black. And studies have been done, uh, uh, particularly with drug addiction, drug addicts, uh, a phenomenon called extreme memory, um, where the nervous system gets stretched so far that it is not resilient enough, the elasticity is gone, and um, it cannot return from a state of exhaustion uh, or fatigue um, from this, um, this state of um, overstretching. Um, the, the study, the drug studies have been done particularly um, to answer the question, why is it that people who have been drug free for a long time, when they relapse, uh, extremely relapse? Where does the extreming of that phenomenon lie? Why does that occur? And um, it has to do, as I said, with this stretching of, um, this overstretching of the nervous system. I want just to close this little capsule uh, to go to Norbert Wiener himself as we think about this kind of imagery. And again, I'd like you to bear in mind my distinction between automaticity and where it comes from, um, as opposed to spontaneity um, uh, and where that comes from. This is Norbert Wiener, uh, the man who coined the term from his memoir, Ex Prodigy. Um, in it, um, if you guys have read it, uh, you'll recall that he is writing on self-referential, probabilistic forms of thought connected with theories of messages and communication. Cybernetics um, is defined as a science of control or prediction of future action. That's what I want to come to, as well as a science of form which entails, and of course we've gone way, way beyond his memoir, uh, this science also um, entails intention detecting processes. That is uh, ways of knowing how you will behave, how you will think, whether you're aware of it or not, how you will react, uh, whether you're aware uh, of it or not. Uh, Anyway, I, uh, this, uh, uh, and once again, um, it also is about controlling you um, knowingly or unknowingly. And the increase, I don't have to tell you, the increase of those unknowing manipulations, um, of course, are on the rise. Um, I uh, want now to move uh, to thinking, uh, actually, I, I know that Mark has done an atlas. I've done a little atlas myself as well. Um, I want to say that this is my topic, and I hope uh, you see uh, the difference. If, in point of fact, we actually look, and here I want to really foreground looking, if we actually look at how human beings behave when they involve themselves in more complex, i.e. prefrontal brain activity, thinking, communicating, investigating, observing, uh, then I think we are struck 
by, first of all, they tend to slow down, and secondly, they hesitate. There's hesitation. There's this moment of uncertainty and ambiguation. Um, I'd say hesitation uh, is a lost co uh, concept in the age of impulse, the age of impulsiveness and impulse. I'm showing, I'm showing you uh, mindful um, uh, of being in the uh, uh, School of Architecture. Uh, I am showing you an Annie Leibovitz photograph of the uh, Japanese architect uh, Kozuyu Sejima, who is intently examining a model of her uh, fairly recently open Museum of Contemporary Art in New York's Bowery. Um, what's extraordinary, you have an artist photographing an artist, which is um, what, I, what I find um, particularly interesting about this. And it brings me back to Changeu and the connection between creativity and memory. It brings us back to many, many things. But a kind of attentive scrutiny um, that uh, looks at something uh, both in the past and the future and reconfigures it, reimagines it. Um, it also, because of the way Leibowitz presents it, um, uh, it becomes itself a marvelously provocative and evocative object for the beholder. That is a beholder who is not Leibowitz, who is not Sejima. Um, with its shimmering two-ply exterior, its metal layered, um, with an outer skin of uh, perforated metal, which, and uh, Leibowitz shows that because you've got both the chiaroscuro effect, the dark and the light. Um, when the sun uh, is out, you get an almost mirage-like aura um, or, um, uh, uh, or a kind of halo intensified by uh, the non-aligned um, boxes. So um, a kind of image uh, where time is also built into it. I mean, if we talk about slowness, the temporal, the spatio-temporal aspect is quite important. Um, if we look just simply at a project uh, by Sejima, again, very importantly, photographed by Annie Leibowitz. This is the addition uh, to the, uh, an addition to the Toledo Museum of Art. Um, which, if you, at first blush you look at it, you think you're looking at another Philip Johnson, a kind of mid-1950s um, glass. But as you look, I mean, it's quite an incredible narrow space, uh, a gallery. Uh, you've got landscape on either side. Um, and it is um, what she has created is this kind of meditative space where inside is out and outside is in. And itself is a haunting reiteration of the mid 20th century uh, see-through glass boxes. Uh, but if you can tell, the walls undulate. Leibowitz catches that rather nicely. And um, uh, there's the, the, the transparent um, inner partitions create this kind of enigmatic uh, effect. The eye is forced to linger. You don't speed through it. Um, and I think that's rather, I, I know all of you go to New York City, so I want to say when you look at this, um, you, uh, I think, will feel that it's very different from the kind of lost in space disorientation of Yoshuri um, Taniguchi's MoMA uh, facade, which has a totally different, rather flat feeling to it. Uh, what uh, I want to do, I, as I said, I've created two little atlases for this talk. Uh, the first, I want to propose to you that I, uh, to get at this new, rather more complex phenomenology um, that's, um, that is in tune um, with the workings of the brain, with particularly the kinds of things that Changeu was describing. I want to introduce um, uh, the new earthworks. Um, since Cornell is quite close, I don't know if I have anybody from Cornell in the audience, uh, but the 1960s had a wonderful earth group at Cornell, but very, very different uh, from what is now emerging. This is Andy Goldsworthy, the Scottish artist who worked internationally. And I um, 
if you have in your mind the work of Robert Heiser, uh, the work of Robert Smithson, the moving of um, uh, the Great Salt Lake sand dune, the creation of uh, this heroic, macho um, moving of Earth, marvelous though it is, is at a polar opposite from what we're looking at here. Uh, which is all about the creation of a situation. If any of you heard Anne Hamilton last night, there was a wonderful moment where uh, she talked about the event of a thread. We talked a little bit about it in class. The event of a thread where coming out of textiles, um, she created, she pointed out that a line is a situation. A line is an event, and if you've got the intersection of two lines, you've got a definite event. In a way, uh, Anne Hamilton is absolutely in tune um, with this new subtlety uh, that has pervaded contemporary art, I think because of this uh, new philosophy and new phenomenology. Andy Goldsworthy creates what we might call barely touched earthworks. Um, for the psychologists, of course, the only reason you really notice something is out of kilter is uh, uh, because of salience, the fact that, of course, leaves do not normally um, assume uh, a conical shape so that uh, that snaps into your attention. But if you ask yourself, what is this meant to do? Uh, is it about subject, object? No. Um, actually, it goes back, I think, to the American pragmatists, to people like William James, William James's psychology, um, and also even to John Dewey. Um, it was they who argued um, that to get rid of that dualism that has absolutely bedeviled the West uh, since Plato, um, what you should think of, it's not subject or object, but rather it's a relationship that produces a situation, what they called an event. Um, this requires, and I have another Andy Goldsworthy, um, as you can see, this is a snowstorm, uh, where the entire piece is a viewer watching a momentary transient event, which is not predictable anti-cybernetics. You can't predict it. You cannot control it. And what happens is the intersituational, uh, if you will. Uh, you're creating something uh, that makes you aware of it and makes you aware that you are aware of whatever it is uh, at the moment. I also uh, want to mention some marvelous new filmmakers. Um, film um, has now, there's a whole spate of filmmaking that is predicated on the micro instant, the micro moment, not the grandiose, not Andy Warhol, although Andy Warhol is an interesting uh, predecessor, I'm, although his sleep um, film took forever. It's almost where you take an instance uh, that is so small that if you don't attend to it, it vanishes. Uh, this, uh, so I want to uh, uh, put this as the power in my atlas, as the power of small movements by filmmaker Peter Hutton. Uh, what you're looking at is, um, and I'm showing you still, I have to, otherwise I'd never get through this talk, but what I'm showing you is a fjord um, in Iceland, and the only motion that occurs is at the horizon. The absolute tiniest motion as the ripples cross uh, the horizon line, which again is unpredictable. Um, um, it is transient, it's ephemeral, and it produces quite a remarkable uh, effect in the viewer in terms not only of bonding, of um, eliding uh, what's normally called inside and outside, but also eliding space and time, because you notice that time is important here. I brought one pseudo-Hollywood uh, example. How many of you saw Shame? Did anybody here see Shame? That marvelous, marvelous film um, uh, by Steve McQueen, um, incredible film, um, which had dialogue but needed none, uh, which was constructed 
Um, uh, it is about eroticism, deep, uh, deeply erotic and yet deeply not erotic, but constructed image by image by image. I know when I came out of it, after an hour and a half, I was shaking because it is so intense, but not dialogically, not narratologically intense. It is intense in its constructedness and the way each scene demands that you pay attention. This is not uh, Hollywood, even though that was an art film. This is actually the other Steve McQueen. This is Steve McQueen, 17-minute version. A powerful uh, uh, movie, uh, simply called Gravesend. Um, it's a video, a short, obviously. Everything is always a short, um, about uh, a mining coal tan. Um, a mineral so valuable that it's the new blood diamond because it's found, uh, as my computer people know, in a host of computer-driven electronics. And of course it's found in Rwanda. Um, it is a film that goes from here to the depths of the earth. I felt I could show this quite honestly to you because it mimics a 19th century magic lantern slide. This, this is the opening of the film and the own of the video, and the only thing that occurs is that the sun, like in a magic lantern show, slips beneath the cloud and then rises again. That's that's the moment. Um, it's like the entire piece is constructed like a musical composition. You know, if you miss a movement, you miss a movement. And um, it is it begins, as I said, with this lyrical. A uh, slow time uh, dissolve, and I wanted to show this piece of of it to you because um, McQueen writes about it. He requites about this piece, and he says um, that Gravesend isn't just any town; it is the town in Kent, uh, England, where Marlowe, uh, Joseph Conrad's sort of anti-hero. Um, from the heart of darkness sets sail for the Congo. So there's this deep analogical structure in addition, but a visual analogical structure uh, that governs it. And McQueen says that he does this um, for two reasons, because he wants to create um, a, a vision of the foreboding melancholy mournfulness uh, that already pervades the first paragraph of The Heart of Darkness, and which he captures in the imperceptible fall and curve of the sun. Those are actually Conrad's words. I want to continue this typology and this atlas in a different direction, and mindful if I do have a scientist I know in the audience, and say that scientists work, um, dep well, depends, but often work from the bottom up. Uh, they work uh, from the inside out. I want to ask the question somewhat differently about attentive attentiveness. Um, I want to ask um, and create with this brief typology, what could one learn? What could one learn about aware awareness by looking from the outside in. By And I began, I want to begin comically, although seriously, um, with what I call the inquisitive look, the look of intellectual curiosity. How do you screw a lamp uh, or a bulb into a lamp? What can you tell? What can you tell by a serious examination of the face? I mean, leaving out for the moment saccadic eye movement, although the fact that the eye is stilled uh, is quite important, even you know that uh, that you don't see um, a wandering uh, wandering gaze, but kind of attentiveness and focus um, uh, that uh, a directedness, and you could say, well, that's just focusing. Uh, yes. Um, motion is also involved, and I'm going to go back to the role of the motor cortex um, in a moment. Um, what can we do with something like this? Um, one of the most difficult things, I think, to describe in language, uh, but I want to get at it um, in vision, is a critical look, or let's put it differently. Let's say um, if 
um, our guy screwing in a light bulb was assessing, he was assessing a situation. This is more difficult. Even in sculpture, you can see that the pupils are rolled to the sides. Um, and I'm going to suggest this is the look of judgment. This is one of the most difficult intellectual activities because why? You have to make a comparison between two things, either familiar, unfamiliar, equal, unequal. You have to adjudicate. You have to bring differences um, into resolution. This bedeviled cunt, I don't have to tell my philosophers, the entire third critique uh, was about the, the so-called uh, faculty of judgment, which in point of fact had no um, anatomical structure, uh, because its entire purpose was to make relationships, that intellectual activity um, that where you had, let me say it again, to attend knowingly to several things and pull them together. Uh, so something else one can look. Um, let's do this. Let's bring in the emotions because we now know from uh, not just Antonio Damasio, but I mean there's a whole affect industry out there studying the emotions. Um, and we now know um, that the emotions are not just uh, situated in the limbic system, uh, but that in a way every, just change was already moving in that direction, every um, creation, every recreation is wrapped around um, with the past. I mean, William James had it right. There's an aura um, around the present, uh, which is called pastness. Um, if we look at this painting, um, what, uh, what can we say about it? Well, the first thing I want to say is that the sitter, and you don't even know who sh need to know who she is, is obviously um, not, um, uh, uh, not acting on impulse. Why can I say that? Why can I say there is something going on here? that has nothing to do with automaticity, automatic reaction, reflex, not acting on impulse. Um, we can also uh, see that she is involved in, Hume is back in uh, contemporary new philosophy of mind, and Hume uh, is interested particularly in what he calls the passions, not just the easy ones, but the mixed passions, i.e. the mixed emotions. Your heart pressed. Um, this is something that uh, the visual uh, can put before you. Your heart pressed to pin this down. Uh, complicated, remorse, regret, but that's not all. That's not all. There's some other inner process that eludes us, but that makes us stop and wonder what's going on. You could say the reviewing of a life. There's some, there's something longer uh, going on there, uh, something longer and mingled. Um, George Bernard Shaw is known as a dramatist, but for those of you interested in photography, he was also a darn good photographer. Uh, this is his portrait of Alvin Langdon Coburn from 1906, and um, I um, want to put something else in here, and that's synesthesia, the synesthetic. It's very interesting that in at least uh, the European languages, um, that looking and thinking are often associated with weight. Um, there is light thought. The French have a whole uh, uh, typology of words. Um, but heaviness, profondeur, um, there's actually also an acoustic value that goes with it, a kind of heaviness. When you look at this, uh, that also goes with the body gestures, the sunken, um, uh, the um, sunken position, um, I want to argue uh, that this is, and our language is rich in it, this is about pondering. There's something heavy that draws you down. Beyond that, there's something else um, to which I'll return at the end. Uh, there is a sense, and this is the temporal too, that the sitter is embarked on some kind of inner immigration. You can't quite put your finger on where thought is. And I will end on 
that. Um, with those, uh, with that, those sorts of questions. Where is thought? Is it in the brain? Is it where is he uh, mentally? Um, coming to a weighty decision, and as I said, a kind of inner um, immigra uh, immigration. I also, uh, because I know scientists are often interested in pathologies. It's the path of pathology of the. Um, of the uh, attentive, uh, and I want to talk about a pathological long look. This is not um, the long, um, slow look that I've been looking at. Um, it's a different lengthy look. It's the look of the voyeur, the voyeur. And I think here, Art, this is actually, this is an extremely interesting installation done um, actually, uh, by an American artist, his name is Warren Needy, but he now works out of, um, he now works in Berlin, uh, but he has a cognitive science degree from Caltech, um, and his work is really very thought-provoking. Um, what Needy immediately captures about the pathology is that, uh, that, it, uh, that the voyeur is totally about the unnatural uncoupling, the unnatural uncoupling of the visual and the motor systems. What makes voyeurism so rigid, so um, in a way immediately counterintuitive to, to us as viewers from the outside is that it freezes what normally is in motion. And we know uh, that the visual system and the motor system are really deeply connected. Um, I, um, there is a, a wonderful but deeply horrible uh, book uh, by the Austrian Nobel laureate uh, Elfriede Jelenic uh, called The Piano Teacher, which is quite interesting uh, because the heroine, if that's the correct word for her, there's also a film, uh, but you should read the book. It's even more obsessive uh, than, uh, than the film was. Um, it's unusual because Voyeur is female, and that's interesting from this piece by, um, uh, by uh, Warren, uh, where um, she says at one point um, that sh uh, she is sub subjugating the heat of effective life to icy scrutiny when she goes to the Prata, uh, the uh, great park uh, in Vienna, the amusement park, and spies on couples making love um, in the grass. Um, but this freezing of the natural impulse here is the other side of um, Warren's piece. Um, I have a section, but I'm going to skip it. I'll just tell you what I was going to do. I began with Runa and uh, the non-erotic. Um, but I also ask in this larger work uh, that I'm working on, uh, another question we might, um, I think would be interesting for scientists uh, to look at with us. And the question is, what kinds of things make us want to attend to them? Not just the problem of why is it such a disappearing entity, but the question, um, I, th I, I think of these moments as those moments unknown to Steven Pinker. Um, they, uh, and one thing that I picked was the erotic, um, where uh, uh, a kind of incredible, um, uh, where you require uh, a special consciousness, um, uh, where consciousness is tied, what shall I say, to an acute wakefulness, an acute wakefulness. Anyway, I have quite a bit to say about that and what's different from it, but I, I'm mindful it's late. And I, I want to talk, and this is what I promised, um, I want to speak about uh, the subtleties of inattention. If we talked about at least one pathology of um, uh, this focused, uh, selective looking, I also think what can be and what needs to be studied um, are two phenomena that are quite, quite different. And one is uh, abstraction, and the other is distraction. And I want to turn to what I think uh, I am working on right now. The, what does it mean to abstract? Um, abstract, in one sense, means to reduce 
um, to distill. But there's another sense, which actually goes back in the history of philosophy, believe it or not, to the medieval period, to somebody like Boethius, who really writes interestingly about it, which is, um, um, well, what I'm interested in here is the fading abstraction as fading in and out of consciousness. These are life-size photographs um, by um, an artist called Ben Jest. They're incredible, over slightly over life-size. And uh, they raise, uh, as I promised earlier, it seems to me the question of the awareness of thought. If you're going to talk about attention, and particularly voluntary attention, um, where is thought? at any given moment. And there is a phenomenon called distributed cognition, um, also distributed consciousness. There are books on um, uh, consciousness in your stomach, in your gut. Why is it that your bowels know uh, certain things before your brain knows them? Where is thought? Um, this, where you're looking at, I mean, just I think is quite brilliant. Um, because you know he is thinking. You know it. Um, you see it in the um, focus of the eyes, and you notice that, again, that is this kind of intent looking. You see it in the set of the face. You see it also in the hands. But let's continue. I have another. I'm going to show you this one. Um, and I want to propose to you that... Uh, just is interested not so much in the self as um, uh, as something with an ego, uh, but rather uh, how we inhabit the self at any given moment, episodically. And there is um, also work on episodic consciousness, episodic awareness, not as I said, the river, uh, the river. Uh, the screen, the narrative, Oliver Sacks writes about that all the time. Not that, not that narrative, but the fact that life uh, and actually thinking has these discrete moments uh, in it. So um, the episodic, so how we inhabit thought at any given moment. These photos, by the way, are made up of a seamless combination of dozens of photographs. Um, and their immediate surroundings, they're very carefully crafted, and there are hints to that uh, that you can see. The hands are always larger than they would be in life. You see the canting of the sidewalk. You see that the background is preternaturally clear, uh, certainly not a conventional uh, reproductive photograph. In other words, it shows you um, how it was made. Um, it is an assembled image that slows down um, otherwise, your fast identifying glance, a guy holding a garbage can lid. Um, I want to propose that just sitters have become dispersed in things. It has something, uh, consciousness is something that's dispersed. It's dispersed also in motion and activity. Again, that's why the voyeur um, is such a pathology. Um, in trappings, in cars, in furniture. It's a kind of Daniel Dennett photograph uh, because there is no single eye um, uh, that rules um, uh, uh, that rules the person. Um, the person utterly self-aware and at the same time um, in an event, in the creation of an event, uh, the center of an event. So thought as a third person phenomenon located at the periphery. This is my third uh, jest. Uh, Marsha putting on jewelry. And again, it's quite obvious. <coughs> Sorry. That it's an assembled image. If you dropped a plumb bob from her nose to her, uh, to her feet, uh, she could not possibly focus uh, on her hands. But again, this study of um, um, uh, the thought as a third-person phenomenon. 
So abstraction, to be abstracted needs to be looked at again. And I want to contrast it with distraction, my final image, um, which we know a kind of restlessness fed by apps and all sorts of uh, other uh, devices, uh, a type of thought that isolates you, a type of thought, and there are very interesting articles both in Nature and Science within the last two years pointing out um, that those of us who believed in multitasking were fed a bill of goods, that in point of fact you could not perform two activities at the same time with the same level of attentional um, intensity. Um, distraction then, um, especially, um, uh, well here, switching tasks, noise, poor concentration, um, inner restlessness, all of, uh, all of these things. Um, different from abstraction. These two things should be studied in uh, tandem. And I'm just going to conclude. Um, what have I been doing? I've been, first of all, I've tried to identify an issue, which I think is the hardest thing for us to do, an issue, uh, not only that we could collaborate on, but that would be of interest, deep interest, to both sides of the aisle, and where very, very important contributions could be made from both sides uh, of the aisle, the scientific and the uh, humanities side of the aisle. Um, and I've tried um, to raise um, three, let's say, at least three issues. My, my, uh, my issue uh, was, as I said, this, um, uh, this problem of aware awareness, of a, of attentiveness, and um, it, uh, there are three things I just kind of want to leave you thinking about, and paradoxes, you name it. Um, first of all, um, as somebody who's worked on vision and the importance of the visual um, for many years, um, it's very strange to find myself in a moment that uh, purports to be massively visual. No, uh, media, I don't care what kind of media, uh, the visual is, is massively important. Um, and at the same time, as I said, an enormous amount of brain research, which is devoted really to non-conscious functions. Um, I think that this research is also shored up by other kinds of research. Um, research on self-organizing structures. I've mentioned uh, studies of the autopoetic systems. There's nobody to, I mean, I'm not denying that. I know, uh, what, 90% um, uh, of uh, brain function is uh, uh, based on um, autopoetic functions. But there's also other sciences involved, and uh, I'm thinking of all the work on self-organizing structures that in a way bolster uh, the work on the, uh, on the involuntary, on, um, on uh, optical illusions. I mean, if any work gets done, it's always on the illusory, on responses that you can't help but make. Um, whether you're looking at nanostructures, complexity, smart prosthetics, genomics, and also a kind of imaging that is uh, brought forward to process that scientific information. What kind of imaging is it? It's automatic image data acquisition, automatic image recovery, automatic image recording and distribution, and automatic image display. Um, I, it leaves me um, with the, I guess, final point I want to make. Uh, that somehow we have lost the fact um, of the importance of voluntary, of conscious activity, deliberateness, uh, free will. It also has uh, actually religious uh, ramifications. And I want to make um, that somehow the role of vision has been compressed in our research to this automatic side of things uh, that I spoke about with Norbert Wiener. And I think uh, what needs to be done, I, I think attention, the problem of the kind of attentiveness that I uh, was uh, proposing, 
is that there has to be, that there's something about conscious vision. Higher primates uh, other than us do not have it. Um, and I think it will, when they finally find the neural correlates of consciousness, it will be related to this kind of attentiveness. Um, but I think what we need to do is devise uh, something that gets pre-selective and selective attention together. Um, and I would propose uh, that works of art are really a marvelous way to do this. Um, and I also encourage you to think of other collaborative projects along the line. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I'm about to lose my voice. Thank you. It is, you, I mean, I could invoke regional styles, I could invoke it, I will say something about world Darwinism because I think it, it fits into your question. Um, I'm not denying that there are values that are associated with a particular culture, but I would say, uh, I mean, there are different levels of attentiveness at different periods, that, and we have lost it. I mean, my argument is it's probably out of the window for the reasons that I try to reduce. But I think also it comes and it was Perugino, I mean, optical devices, of course, were known at that time, I'm magnifying glasses, glasses, uh, just, that is, eyeglasses, just came uh, into, uh, uh, into uh, use. And the, the wonder of uh, the individual detail, I mean, what we're talking about is, maybe uh, the delight in the detail that stops you. Uh, now, of course, you could say to me, Barbara, and that's saliency, of course. To me, that was salient because I was drawn to it and there is something in me that draws to it. But I want to go beyond that, I mean, for sure. Um, there was also the delight in the artist at using optical devices that would allow him to do that, to paint with a single hair and do that. And there was also an audience that was enamored with that. Um, so I, beyond that, I don't know what I can say. You know, I can't, uh, uh, I, I can't say it. But I can say that, um, I should talk more about detail, um, in a way, Carrera detail uh, is 
that side piece that is meant to draw the eye, that is meant to attract you. Even in ancient theory, uh, in antique theory, Greek uh, aesthetics, John Pollock, what John Pollock writes about, that parerga, the detail, is what in a way snaps you to. Um, you've got this huge crucifixion. This is a big painting if we're thinking of the same we thing. Are. And the detail becomes as the eye wearies, and there is interesting writing about the wearying of the eye in larger compositions that somehow snaps to. Does that somehow get to your uh, get to the point? It's, it's, it's an invitation to, to, to slow looking. Yes, it you is an invitation. I mean, one could, and I should have said more, uh, there's a whole literature. We talk about the arabesque. We talk, there's one Horace writing on uh, what you shouldn't do in art. What you should not do is paint all of these little goo these little garlands that the Rococo adored uh, with little putti, and why does everybody adore it? Why does everybody go to the frame instead of looking at the main picture? I mean, no, you ask a really critical question. And everybody adores because they're usually doing lewd things, or there are satyrs uh, romping around, or there's a bird with wings, and, and then a lion's tail, things like that. Um, the, um, you're also drawn uh, to the incongruous, in a way, to that which doesn't belong. And I would say that partly to that scene. Why would you have, except for the sheer hell of it, uh, why would you have that little uh, landscape with the boats in this massive scene of a, a crucifixion. Um, but I want to think about that because it also speaks to different audiences. Um, and also the weariness of, if anybody's gone through a gallery of Baroque or uh, Renaissance Baroque paintings, massive, you know, particularly in the Baroque, you know, massive paintings, and then something that grips the eye which we might call prayer or the ornamental. So we need, we need a new theory of the ornament. I like that for decor. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your t multiple events today. I appreciated them both tremendously. Thinking through your talk in the voluntary and the location of thought, can thought be located in the mercurial effective assemblage between the voluntary and the involuntary of the interstitial relationships that disrupt providing a situational hesitation that facilitates slow looking in the encounter between bodies and objects creating the events of the two lines <coughs> intersecting that you speak. If the interstices, yeah, I mean, that's a way, yeah, I, uh, that thought, uh, see, I didn't talk in the, uh, what I, maybe if, uh, and I'm so grateful I didn't because honestly I think I'm losing my voice. I'm, I'm grateful I didn't have to. But one thing that I, because of Anke's lovely paper, um, that made me uh, made me think of it is I wanted to show images that I think I but I wrote about it in um, Echo Objects. Images that are thought provoking. That is no. Let me put it differently. Images that. Um, I don't want to have thought as an afterthought, before or after. Images that are labor intensive. I'm going to put that together with selective attention. Um, in a way, your little ship on the ocean, painted with a single uh, brush stroke, was labor intensive. It was t it's a different style, if I'm recalling, than from this larger Perugino, and it's so minute. Um, that it calls for us to lean in in every way. Um, and there are images that are labor intensive that really do it. Collage is a good example. Mosaic, and I want to say something about mosaic and grid. These formats uh, that are like metaphors, they take something from here, and they take something else from here that don't belong together, and they put them together, you know, like a mosaic does. One tessera, one tessera, little bit of uh, matrix in between. Um, two styles, the bam, like that, you notice it. Um, I think those are the thoughts. Emblems are a perfect example of it. When you have an emblem of some abstract term like vanity, 
And it is made from these different parts, just like the ornaments that Horace writes against. And you put that stuff together. Um, what happens? You look at it, uh, and it makes you work. I mean, it makes you work prefrontally. It makes you work as opposed to images that kind of flow in, optical illusions, things that are easy, that address our reward systems, that kind of flow in, that don't have edges. Um, so, I'm sorry, I'm giving you kind of a long answer, but that, I think, it is the answer to your question. If you would agree. Thank you. No, uh, did I miss it? Did I miss it? You were talking about the interstices, which made me think of putting things together, coupling things. Um, thought is about bringing many different things, discrete things together. Discrete things have to be put together. And the question is, how do you do it? Do you mush them all together into a kind of nice illusionistic flow that kind of comes in, which a lot of new media does, or do you, going back uh, to the grid or the mosaic, do you create little pixels of information where you see how they're put together? And somehow thought is in the interstices there. That's what I would say. Um, it's in the work, but it's also in you working to understand the work. Is that clear? No, everybody's still looking for I'm having another sip. So, so that's, a, that's a notion of where is the trace of the thought, or where is the what requires thought and what rewards thought. Is that right. what you're well, is that you're also, using where is thought being? I am saying it's, well, in where is thought, I think it's really a wonderful example of distributed cognition. That is, thought is in your fingers, you know, when you're holding the garbage can, your uh, lid. Uh, thought as a distributed phenomenon. Um, and thought is not something that's a flow. Uh, although, of course, sometimes it is, but thought that's more situational, it's more like an event, it's episodic. Um, and um, your psychologist, aren't you? I'm seeing Galen Strawson's very interesting essay by, I, I was trained in continental philosophy, but I started to read, unfortunately, I have to read all the British analytic guys. Galen Strawson, son of a very famous father, Strawson, uh, wrote a wonderful essay uh, on episodic consciousness, and I thought, you know, that, it, and, but it's elsewhere as well, where he says, you know, people go on and on about this kind of Bergsonian stream of consciousness, but he said, you know, I never had that experience. I mean, they, you know, how they always start from their own life. Um, and he said, no, but I belong to this historical character, Montaigne, of the essays, you know, he went through a whole uh, litany of actually rather famous writers, and uh, where thought, uh, where you kind of lurch, if I can put it that way, that's what I say the mosaic. Mosaic is important. Mosaic is not, you know, if your eye travels over a mosaic, you keep falling into the interstices. And it's kind of lurching, and that goes also with static eye movements. Um, and so, and you fool yourself into thinking that you're having this grand stream, but really, and some days your episodes really are close together. But I think Strassman's really a good essay uh, points out there are days they're not. And you know, uh, and it relates, I think, also to what I said earlier about the American pragmatism, about James and so on, about it's not about subject and object, it's about the event. In other words, we're kind of structured by the event or the situation that either faces you or in which you're the center of, like uh, Andy Goldsworthy, you know, and we're watching uh, you know, the leaves uh, flowing, uh, flowing away. Thank you. That's very it. Much. You're letting me off that easy? I was going to relieve your voice. Of oh, well, I was going to have another slur if somebody <laughs> has a uh, vital question. I don't One more question. No, no, no. Please. Okay. No, no. Uh, we, Yes. So this, I, I wish to put back, up, push back on the voluntary, bit, especially with the James okay. event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What can there be an effective network that provides nodes of thought between us if we are all at the gallery and viewing and gazing at the same installation? Yes, you have to there? look at my. I mean, this is. I'm very proud of this. There's a wonderful photograph uh, that I have. I mean, um, by is a gallery. I can't remember. 
here. Uh, in my um, uh, in my echo objects, we're going to talk about that. How even, or you can say like a rave, where people suddenly uh, move together. And he takes a photo. He has a series of photographs uh, of people in art galleries. And the one I reproduce is of looking at Jericho, the Wrath of the Medusa. If you guys remember that picture. Um, which is on a strong, sort of Baroque diagonal. And the audience, um, uh, the people who are looking at it, actually move in sync um, to uh, a position. They're not scattered in the gallery, but they actually move and make uh, a formation that really echoes uh, the composition of the picture. This is an other passion of mine with the, uh, the romantics, the grammars of expression, too, which I think all of this is coming back. Um, the notion, I keep stressing formats, guys, and compositions. Compositions aren't casual. Uh, there is always, and um, oh, I'm forgetting the guy at Harvard who is, uh, 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 who got into trouble, uh, this cognitive psychologist, you know who I mean. Uh, but wrote a wonderful, um, I don't think it obviates what he wrote. Uh, he's very interested in what he calls the skeletal um, that lurks underneath phenomena. And I write about it, actually, in both those last books, about the shape beneath the shape that you intuitively respond to. I mean, you're directed by looking uh, to take that and then, of course, um, uh, you become involved in a certain way, but um, those, you guys are probably too young for this, but you don't remember all these art books with tracing paper, um, where you had the diagram, those things are really important, and they're important now, I think, with neuroscience, because that, in a way, Mark, what's his name, it's Mark, you know who I mean, he got into such trouble, he got into such trouble, it's a damn good book, though, um, still, but he is talking about those skeletal, the diagrammatic, um, that actually motivates you. And uh, as I said, I wish I wasn't here. I'm sorry, I'm really Stroop. blanking. Stroop. Yes, thank you. Thank you for reminding me what I wrote. He reminds me of what I wrote. But anyway, those are marvelous. And also, he does, you should see it, because he does. Um, brilliant photographs of also, those are old systems of order, but also the dissolution of order. He does a wonderful one of Notre Dame with its three <coughs> tiers and all of these people who are, you know, the modern tourists, you know, everybody going every which way. It is the most, he's brilliant, wonderful um, juxtaposition of one system of order that is totally banished and, of course, a no order or non order or a buzz that is happening down below. Yeah, he's brilliant. Thank you for reminding me. Anyway, yes, yes. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, I was just about to mention the, the Thomas Struth. Yes, I'm sorry, Struth, what is the matter? I think it is the gallery series. Yes, it's the gallery series, exactly the gallery series. You guys should look at it, and especially the scientists, because of this response. Um, Mark Hauser, isn't that who I'm thinking yeah, of? Yeah. I knew it would come to me. <laughs> and this total underpinning what does eventually, but Sidonka is having an episode. But anyway, uh, yes, that's the Gallup Street, Street, uh, Street, and Street, and he, and that one, the Jericho, is so particularly brilliant. And then all the pictures of the you know, Unraveling in Venice and, and Rome and, and so on. Yeah, no, thank you for that. So I think um, it seems like a lot of what we talked about has a lot to do with both the artist as the creator, and yes. how the function that's happening as they're producing the artwork, but also having to do with the viewers. Yes, so I want you to get them both together. Yeah. So I was wondering, um, just your thoughts on the different, um, at least, I'm, I'm also an architect here. Oh, right. Question, but, um, in terms of the actual production of work and the production of drawing, is there, um, relationships between the type of production, whether it be digital or hand drawn, you were just mentioning the trace paper with the diagrams above it. Um, and then um, also in your book you mentioned Stephen Pinker. Yes. Yes. Uh, mentioning about how cognitive functions being uh, 
um, or art being a relationship with kind of a function a preference. Specifically <coughs> preference. And so um, whether it's um, artistic preference of digital versus artistic preference for manual, but what can be gained and learned from both the viewer and also the creative aspect. I mean it could be also um, science drawing um, like the darker and photography film versus digital. Oh yes, yes. I mean those are all different processes and they also but I think it's forgotten because we tend to level things on, on single platforms is the fact that uh, all of those things really put pressure on different brain areas. They have different formats. That's why I keep saying different formats do different things. I did promise, by the way, also, I, although it doesn't feature here, but you know, Darwinism, uh, somebody like Gerald Edelman, uh, Wider Than the Sky, brilliant, brilliant books. But in a way, I'm a little Darwinist because you know people uh, are, I'm used to people yelling more at me and saying, well, you know, how do you say culture is doing this and that? But I'm not denying that. And Edelman, um, it, you should read him. And uh, B.S. Ramachandran, I mean, his, some of his principles are kind of preposterous, but some on the heat shift effect, and they're wonderful things uh, that he does say, and you can't dispute it. It's it's just saying that we are both hard and soft wired. That's all. Uh, but we're not, uh, we are not Norbert Wieners. <laughs> we are not, we are not. Anyway, please remember that distinction between spontaneity and authenticity. Uh, but, uh, you know, beyond that, I, it would take me, uh, in a way, I'm trying to show how those two things come together. That is both what the artist does and what it produces in you. And I think this return to what I want to call the event or the situational is a way that you also creating, as Anne Hamilton did last night, uh, creating a situation where you are acutely aware of what's happening there, but also acutely aware of what's happening in here. You, uh, those, uh, she's really quite brilliant with that, and you've got a great example up on your campus. So that's good. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. I should close, I need to close this down.